Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Legal Issues for Artists, Protecting Your Works from the Moment of Creation and Beyond. My name is Eric Knight. I am the Development Director for the Museum of Ventura County. On behalf of the museum and the museum supporters, I'd like to thank the Ventura County Bar Association, the law firm of Ferguson, Case, Orr, and Patterson, the law firm of Sislow and Thomas, and the law firm of Myers, Witters, Gibson, Jones, and Feingold for making today's program possible. And of course, thank you all who are attending. Thank you all who are attending for being here today. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping first. We will have a Q&A following the panel discussion. Uh, that'll be at about 1.15 p.m. Um, please make sure you put your questions in the Q&A box. At the bottom of your Zoom there, you'll see that there's a chat box. Uh, you'll also see a Q&A. Please make sure your questions go in the Q&A. That will be monitored throughout the program. If you put a question in the chat, it's likely to get lost in the shuffle. So uh, please do put your questions in throughout the program. It will be monitored. We will get to uh, as many as possible at 1.15 and make sure they go in the Q&A there. Uh, so with that, I will now turn it over to Jacqueline D. Ruffin, attorney at law with Myers, Witters, Gibson, Jones, and Feingold to introduce today's panelists and to get the program underway. Jacqueline. Thank you, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. As just mentioned, my name is Jacqueline Ruffin. I am the current Ventura County Bar Association board president. I'd like to take a moment to share some information about VCBA, and then I will briefly introduce our panelists. VCBA was formed in 1928 as a nonprofit business association of local attorneys. Our membership ranges between about 750 members to 1,000 lawyers in any given year. And it includes attorneys practicing in nearly every area of law. Among other activities, VCBA provides continuing education courses for attorneys, honors local judges and attorneys who have made significant pro bono contributions to our community, raises money for Ventura County Legal Aid at VCBA's annual dinner, and offers a loyal referral service that connects community members to local attorneys. This year, VCBA is expanding its community outreach efforts by initiating the ASK program. ASK stands for Attorneys Sharing Knowledge. This new program offers free legal presentations to underserved parts of our community. I'm proud to announce that today's event is the first ASK program. I'm really excited about this collaboration with the museum for today's presentation, which had nearly 90 people register. And I really thank the entire museum team for helping to bring this event to fruition. I'm, I'd also like to take a moment to thank Carolyn Mullen at the Oxnard Performing Arts Center who helped us develop topics for today's discussion. With that background, I'd like to introduce our esteemed group of panelists. And I really mean that. We truly have some of the top intellectual property attorneys in our community presenting to you today. First, we will hear from Rebecca Makatalo of the Cislo and Thomas Law Firm. Rebecca has expertise in all areas of IP law, including copyrights, trademarks, and patents. She will cover copyright basics and some issues pertinent to musicians' rights. Next, Brian Philpott and Corey Donaldson will present. Brian litigates patent issues, has a specialty in internet and domain name matters, and handles international IP issues. Corey focuses on patent prosecution, and design, trademark, and trade dress procurement. Corey and Brian will speak about fair use issues. Our um, next presenter will be Jay Heibel, who handles a variety of patent and trademark matters. He will, he will discuss um, NFTs in our presentation today. I want to give Jay some special recognition because when I contacted him about the possibility of being a presenter, not only did he immediately agree to speak, but he also brought his colleagues, Corey, Brian, and uh, Brian Fitzgerald from the Ferguson case for Patterson Law Firm. So thank you, Jay, for that. Our final panelist will be Brian Fitzgerald. Um, his expertise includes patent prosecution, IP licensing contracts, and IP litigation. And he will touch upon estate planning issues unique to artists. Finally, you may have noticed that when I was given this brief overview of our panelists' expertise, that they all have um, a background in patent law. That's a high level IP designation available only to attorneys with a scientific background. Our panelists have degrees in biology, electrical engineering, civil engineering, and environmental engineering. And we are really privileged to have them with us here today. With that, I will now hand the presentation over to Rebecca. Thank you, Jacqueline, for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming today. My name is Rebecca Makitalo. And as Jacqueline said, I'm an associate at the law firm of Cislo and Thomas in Westlake Village. Cislo and Thomas is a full service law firm and we handle both 
trial and transactional sides of intellectual property matters. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking about the basics of copyright law and musicians' rights. So first and foremost, what is a copyright? A copyright is a form of protection provided by the laws of the United States to original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible form of expression. An original work of authorship is a work that's independently created by a human author and possesses at least some degree of minimal creativity. So who gave authority for copyright law? The US Constitution provides in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, that Congress has the power to promote the progress of science, which is patents, and useful arts, copyright, by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Basically, the purpose of copyright law is to advance a culture of creativity. This incentivizes, incentivizes artists to create more when their works are being protected. They get a monopoly for basically a limited amount of time. Congress can give these exclusive rights for a limited time though to only authors and writings. So what works are eligible for copyright protection? This is a non-exhaustive list, but the, the basic works that are, are uh, protected are literary works, musical works, dramatic works, pantomimes and choreographic works, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural, also known as PGS, motion pictures and other audiovisual works, sound recordings, and architectural works. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at musical works and sound recordings. But what does copyright law not protect? Copyright law does not protect titles, names, and short phrases. This is where trademark law is very useful. It does not protect against ideas, procedures, or methods. And in the context of music, the idea for a love song about a traveling musician is itself not protected, but the expression or the lyrics specifically to that song are protected. Works in the public domain are also not protected. These mean that the works have either expired or were not uh, eligible for copyright protection. I'll cover the term of a copyright shortly, but as far as works that have entered the public domain, if a works copyright has expired, you are free and clear to use that work without permission from the copyright owner. Also with regard to music, a groove, a vibe, or a feel is not copyrightable. Neither is the style of music, such as jazz, pop, rock and roll, those types. You just can't copyright a genre of music. So what's required for copyright eligibility? Copyright, again, protects the expression of an idea, not the idea itself. So copyright protection in the US exists automatically from the moment you create it, when the original work of authorship is fixed. So there's two requirements, originality and fixation. What does it mean to be original? It means it came from you and there's some sort of creativity involved. A work is fixed when it's captured either by you under the authority of the author or by the direction of the author in a sufficiently permanent medium such that the work can be perceived reproduced or communicated for more than a short period of time. Examples in the music context consist of sheet music, an audio recording or video recording. So once you have a copyright, what are the six exclusive rights that the Copyright Act affords? This basically means you have the right to exclude others from doing the following. The first is the right to reproduce. This is to make a copy. The second is to prepare derivative works. This comes up often in the context of movies that are based off of uh, literature or scripts. So the original work is the lit literature or script, but the derivative work again is the movie. The third is the ability to distribute copies or phono records to the public by sale. This is just the right to sell your work. The fourth, in the case of literary, music, dramatic, choreographic works, pantomimes, motion pictures, and others is the right to perform the copyrighted work publicly. This is the right for public performance. The fifth, in the case of literary, music, dramatic, choreographic works, pantomimes, and PGS, it's the right to display the copyrighted work. Specifically in the context of music, this is important 
for the composition. The composition is the lyrics and the melody, which we'll get to later. But the lyrics themselves are protected under copyright. So when you see shops on Etsy or other sites and they wanna print on t-shirts, the lyrics, that's under copyright protection. So even though fans wanna you know, customize shirts and sell them, that's also not allowed unless you get permission from the copyright owner. Lastly, in the case of sound recording, it's a right to perform the copyrighted work publicly by means of digital audio transmission. This is important as it comes up in the context of radio, Spotify, Apple Music, anywhere where the music is being digitally and, uh, and is performing a digital audio transmission. So how long does a copyright last? So throughout the years, there's been many differing ways to calculate the duration of a copyright and the duration has has often changed but currently for all works that are created and fixed after January 1st 1978 the copyright lasts for the author's life which is the last author in the case that there is more than one author plus seven years after the death of the last author so what does the copyright registration process look like Remember, copyright exists automatically in an original work of authorship once it's fixed in a tangible medium. However, to ensure protection and to enforce these exclusive rights that you're offered by the Copyright Act, you want to be able to prevent infringers from infringing on your copyright. So it's necessary to register the work with the Copyright Office. To register the work, the author or owner submits an application, including a non-refundable filing fee, a deposit, which is a copy of the work being registered with the Copyright Office. And then once the Copyright Office um, receives all of these, you will get a, um, a, you will get your copyright. And then the Copyright Office will submit a certificate of registration. The effective date of your registration is the day that the copyright receives the copyright office receives the entirety of your application, including the fee and deposit. So once a work is registered, you are provided a certificate of registration. The author can then provide a copyright notice to the public using the copyright symbol or the word copyright. Now remember, a registration can be made at any time within the life of the copyright, but there are benefits to registering it earlier. So what are the benefits? Registration basically puts others on notice of your rights by creating a public record, which, which is then helpful for deterring possible infringers. Registering your work also allows copyright owners to sue for infringement of the work. A copyright, a copyright registration is prima facie evidence of the validity of your copyright when you're filing suit. If registration is made within three months after publication of the work, or prior to infringement of the work, a copyright owner is eligible for statutory damages, attorney's fees, and costs. Now this can be extremely important as litigation is very expensive. A copyright owner may also seek statutory and attorney's fees for infringement only if the infringement began after the effective date of registration. So now you know a little bit about the basics of copyright, who can get a copyright, and the benefits of copyright registration. But as far as music, how does that apply? So there are two distinct copyrights in music. There's the master, which is a sound recording. This is the production, the actual artist performance, everything that goes into a song sound. This is the actual recording of the song that you hear. So absent a contract, this would traditionally belong to the recording artist. But typically nowadays, they're often assigned to the record company label or um, they belong to the record company under a work for hire agreement. The second copyright is the composition. This is the lyrics and the musical arrangement. This is anything you sing, hum, write. This is all the composition copyright. This is originally held by the songwriter or the composer. But again, this is typically assigned to the publishing company. It's important to note that each the master and the composition can be separately copyrighted and owned. So let's take a look at an example. All Along the Watchtower was originally written and composed by Bob Dylan. It has since been performed and covered by Jimi Hendrix. In this situation, the copyright in the musical composition, i.e. the lyrics and melody, is owned by Bob Dylan or his publishing company, 
And then the copyright in the sound recording, such as the Jimi Hendrix version, the cover version, is owned by Jimi Hendrix. So he owns the copyright in the sound recording, whereas Bob Dylan owns the copyright in the musical composition. So you can see that they can be owned by separate people or entities. So what's the importance of having these two copyrights? Really, it's for artists that want to create revenue from their copyrights. So the master or the sound recording, most of the revenue comes from the record sales and master use license fees. Um, basically, to use the actual song or the to use the actual recording of the song in film, TV, streaming, or other networks, this is what a master use license is for. So remember though, if you sign a record deal, the record label acquires certain rights to the master or sound recording of the copyright, including its revenues. Digital performance royalties are also offered for recordings. This is where your song is electronically transmitted. So for the composition, what kind of revenues can you get from this? This is again, the lyrics and the musical arrangement, arrangement including notes, melodies, and chords. So there are performance royalties for these songwriters. There are also mechanical royalties, which are fees paid per song for every copy of the song made. The Harry Fox Agency is the foremost mechanical rights agency. This agency administers and issues compulsory licenses, collects and distributes the mechanical royalty license fees at any time the song is, digitally, is sold digitally or manufactured in physical form. You can also receive revenue from sync licenses. This is if the song is synced to film or TV. So whenever you have a song and you are the owner of the sound recording and also the underlying composition, and you would like to license your song for it to be used in film or TV or another streaming service, it's important for the streaming service to get the sync license and also the master use license because you can gain revenue from both those licenses. So really, how do you maximize your rights and monetize your copyrights as a musician, because that's what it's all about, protecting yourself and being able to get revenue for the period of time that your copyright exists. So firstly, you can register your copyright with the US Copyright Office. This is the most important as you put, other, you put others on notice of your copyrighted work and you have the ability to enforce your bundle of rights in an infringement action. And if you register within the period of time required, you can get statutory damages, attorney's costs, and fees. You can also join the Harry Fox Agency. Again, the Harry Fox Agency collects for me mechanical royalties. You can also join a PRO. A PRO is a performance rights organization. This performance rights organization collects royalties on behalf of songwriters and publishers which means they collect royalties on behalf of your composition copyright. You are earning performance royalties when your songs are broadcasted and publicly performed. In the US, there are three main PROs, VMI, ASCAP, and CSAC. Joining one of these PROs will ensure that you'll receive royalties anytime your music is publicly performed. Now, as far as the sound recording, you can register with the sound exchange. Sound Exchange collects digital performance royalties for the sound recording copyright owner. The Sound Exchange is a nonprofit organization that's put in place by the United States Congress to collect and distribute digital performance royalties for the featured artist and sound recording owner. If you're an artist or musician and you want to learn more about how to protect your IP through copyright, or you have questions or comments regarding this presentation, please feel free to contact me at my email or by calling Cecil and Thomas. Thank you so much for having me. And now I turn it over to our next presenter, Brian Philpott. Brian, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Philpott. Thank you for uh, joining. I'm a partner uh, at Ferguson K. Spore Patterson. Uh, we are headquartered there in um, Ventura, close to the museum on South Kimball Road. And uh, we are a full service law firm. We handle uh, legal issues ranging from trusts and estates to taxation to construction litigation uh, to general business. Uh, Corey 
Brian Fitzgerald and Jay and I all are, are members of the uh, intellectual property practice group. And we handle all types of IP, uh, trademarks, copyrights, patents, and we do both transactional work to help you get registration for your intellectual property. And we also litigate matters if um, that you need to enforce your intellectual property or, or even uh, defend against accusations of infringement. So today uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, intellectual property uh, fair use in the context of copyrights. So you see there on the screen, there's a, a, a picture of, of uh, Vanity Fair a magazine cover featuring Demi Moore. And on the right hand side is, is uh, Leslie Nielsen in the Naked Gun series. And I think it's, uh, we can all argue that the use on the right hand side is quite clearly a fair use in that is parodic and expressive. It is a parody of the uh, original work there, which is the Vanity Fair cover. So um, again, Rebecca did a great job of outlining for you what a copyright is. Um, it's an exclusive bundle of rights. I, I like to use the mnemonic device uh, CAD PD, which means that those bundle of rights that comes with your authorship is the right to exclude others from copying, adapting, distributing, publicly performing, and making derivative works. And the examples, uh, some examples of common copyrights are books and paintings and photographs, sculptures, uh, movies and television shows, and importantly, as Rebecca pointed out, music. So what is fair use? Well, uh, generally, it is the right of a user to use someone else's copyrighted work without that author or creator's permission. And fair use is a doctrine which is grounded uh, generally in the First Amendment, and that we ought to be able to to use the works of others and add on to those uh, in an expressive way, uh, or sometimes even in a nominative way, uh, and, and not be afraid that we'll be ha uh, hailed in support for, for copyright infringement. So fair use is codified. It, it is in the code at 17 USC 107, for those of you who are in the legal community or, or just want to look that up. Um, it's always a balancing test that considers four different factors, and those are listed there for you, the purpose and character of the use. What's important about this factor is to remember that we're talking about the new use here. So what is the purpose and character of the new use that we're analyzing to see whether or not that use is fair? Uh, the nature of the copyrighted work. Here, the, this factor focuses uh, not on the use, but instead on the underlying work that is being used. So we would ask, okay, so what is being adapted here? What's the nature of that copyrighted work? And we'll um, we'll breathe some more life into these factors here when we get to the uh, fair use checklist slides. The third factor is the amount and substantiality of the portion used. Obviously here, the more of the underlying work that is used, uh, the less that that favors a, a finding of fair use. Uh, so if you only use a small portion, then you're, you're, you're better off there making your fair use case. The fourth factor is the effect um, of the use upon the copyright holder or owner's market. So how does this new use affect their ability to commercialize and capitalize on their own, uh, on their own copyrighted work? Can we advance? There we go. Okay, so uh, in, in thinking about what would be most useful for you all as um, artists and contributors um, in our community, I was thinking that we, we should provide you with one of the fair use checklists. Now, several organizations have come up with their own uh, checklists out there. One of which I'm, I'm showing you here on the screen is from the Columbia uh, Library. So you can go there and look, at, download a PDF which has their fair use checklist on it. Uh, we also, the, the following four slides will also walk you through that checklist and you can download those and print those off and use that in the same way you would the PDF from copy from, uh, from Columbia. Uh, the fair use factors are only meant as guidelines, okay? They're, they're, they shouldn't be applied mechanically. In other words, you shouldn't go through and check off boxes and, and tally them up and say, well, I have uh, 10 boxes here favoring fair use and only three again opposing fair use, therefore it must be um, a fair use. That's not the way it works. That's not the way courts do it. The application of the factors is always highly, spec, highly fact specific. And uh, it's more of a holistic analysis uh, once we look at all of the different factors favoring and opposing fair use. Um, my advice is that if you go through the list and it's not immediately 
uh, apparent to you whether or not your use is a fair one that you would seek the advice of counsel and see if they can help you through the analysis to, to find one way or the other, and maybe even author an opinion for you about whether or not your use uh, would be a fair one. Okay, so the, here we're getting into the, the checklist here, and this is the first factor, which is the purpose and character of the use. So you'll see on the left-hand side, we have those factors which would favor fair use and those on the right, which would oppose it. So when you're doing your own analysis, you should go through and check and, and you should do this objectively and then sort of see where is where does my use lie along the uh, spectrum. Sometimes it's very obvious that it's a fair use or that it's not, but in most, in most cases, there's some gray area. And, and indeed in the legal community, that's normally what we see in the cases that we study are those are those instances where it's not clearly a fair use uh, or not a fair use and, and the courts are having to help us decide that. So you'll see the fair use, this is again, the purpose and character of the, of the new use. So if you're using it to teach for any of these educational purposes, research, scholarship, you'll note that these all, all of these are favored fair use, uh, fair uses and would, and would favor a finding of fair use. Nonprofit educational institutions, that's another, uh, another big one there. Three of the, the most important uh, uses that typically are fair are comment, criticism, parody. You'll also see news reporting and those uses that are transformative or productive. And also if you restrict access to those who, who can see it, that favors you. And then on the other side, you'll see um, those opposing fair use. If it's a commercial activity, they're profiting from it. If it's just for entertainment, um, those factors would militate against a finding of fair use. And the second uh, factor here is the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it published or unpublished? That matters. Is it factual or nonfiction based? In other words, is it uh, the writing about facts, which you should be able to have free access to, um, to use in your own, uh, in your own fair way? Um, is it a highly creative work? If it is, that opposes fair use. And we're talking here, of course, fiction, uh, music and novels and films. Those kinds of um, works which we typically think of as highly expressive, you're going to have uh, fair uses at its, its lowest ebb there. You're not going to be able to use those as freely as you would uh, those works which are based in fact. Three is the amount of the work used. Did you use a small or a large portion of it? Um, it's not only just a, a, qual a quantitative analysis, it's also qualitative. You have to ask, was the portion that I used central to the message of the underlying work. If so, uh, that tends to favor, that tends to oppose a fair use. If it's sort of just an ancillary idea in the work, then then that favors a fair use. But uh, you're you're considering not just the amount used, but also what was the portion that I used. Okay, go to the fourth. Okay, this is the uh, effect on the market for the work, and this is I think probably the most difficult. Um, factor for us in the bar to uh, to work with, but this is really getting at: Does the new use, in some way, usurp the mark or the copyright holder or owner's market for its works? So um, again, the factors are all lining up to uh, give us some some insight into whether or not the market was taken away from the from the copyright holder. So was the user's own copy legally purchased or acquired? How many copies were made? Um, does their distribution of those copies or their use of the copies in any way infringe the market of the copyright holder to sell? Is there a licensing mechanism that they can easily use? And then on the other side, of course, are the other side of those factors. Did you make a bunch of copies? Um, is the license that you would have to obtain uh, unreasonably expensive? So, um, you know, th these are all things that you have to consider on this fourth factor of Am I taking away the mark holder's market to commercialize their own copyright by my new use? Okay, so, so here's some examples of, of um, instances where a new use has, has made its way through the courts. And you'll see here on uh, the left-hand side, this use, the original, um, the original photograph here is a picture of an indigenous person, and this was, sort of the photographers, this is what they were doing, going out and capturing uh, pictures of these, uh, of these people. And then the, the new use was uh, taking sort of modern, um, modern components and integrating those into the photograph. You'll see there on the, on the right 
he has some purple sunglasses on and he's now holding a guitar. This, these changes were considered to be transformative and thus qualified as a fair use. On the contrary, on the right-hand side, um, Andy Warhol, who, who I'm sure we all have heard of, took some photographs of the musical artist Prince and did it, sort of his, his trademark uh, coloration and, and uh, design scheme. And that was deemed not to be a fair use because it wasn't transformative enough. Now, something that you need to stay away from is I always hear when clients come in, they ask, well, uh, I'm supposed to change 30% of, of the underlying work. And if I do that, then it will be a fair use and will be considered transformative. That is not true. There is no set percentage or any bright line test that allows you to determine whether or not your use is fair. Instead, you need to go through the factors objectively and try to determine that based on those factors, not on any kind of percentage of change or anything like that. Lastly, I wanted to point you all to uh, the Creative Commons group. That's a group that's creating licenses which allow you to easily uh, share your, uh, your copyrighted works and to, to designate certain of those exclusive rights to the public where you allow the public to adapt your work maybe um, as long as they attribute you as the, uh, as the creator of that work. And there are six different licenses that Creative Commons offers. I would, um, I would invite all of you to go to their website and check those out and they vary. Uh, you know, along a range of very permissive to minimally permissive, and you can kind of see what works best for you. And that's a way to allow you to share your work and encourage adaptation and collaboration without giving away all of your rights and without spending a lot of money to go have an attorney license for you. That's it for that slide. And with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Corey Donaldson, who's going to tackle uh, fair use in the trademark context. Hi everyone, Corey Donaldson here. Uh, as previously mentioned, I work with Brian and then the, the next two presenters here over at Ferguson Case or Patterson. Um, so, so far we've done an excellent job covering the copyright context, uh, but what happens a lot is that you're often facing more than one intellectual property, property right uh, at any one time. So uh, what we wanted to do next was have a little bit of fun, go through those other, the other two big intellectual property rights uh, that are Kind of go hand in hand with copyright sometimes and um, go through sort of some of the most famous cases um, that are out there and uh, sort of assess fair use and uh, go from there. So one second here. So the second type of intellectual property right that you're often worried about in fair use uh, is going to be trademark rights. So those are going to be, you know, the word McDonald's or the golden arches or, or things like that, or, or Apple's logo that has a bite taken out of it. Or in this case, over on the right, uh, Louis Vuitton's uh, toile, um, that, that pattern. So the other right that comes up a lot and is actually in the news a lot right now is called the right of publicity. Uh, in the news right now, you are probably hearing of it as NIL or name image likeness rights. And basically it's a person's right to control use of those things. So um, it'll apply to you know, your picture. Jim Brown over here is part of a very famous trademark and, and right of publicity case. Or your voice, your signature, your photograph, your likeness. Um, it's state by state, so it varies widely, um, but um, it's your right to control things about you as a person. Uh, so, and as I mentioned, the NCAA uh, is in the news a lot right now because they're just now starting to let athletes monetize their NIL rights. So it's going to have a big uh, impact on the you know, NCAA sports in general. You know, do, do high schoolers start choosing to go to certain colleges because they can make more money there uh, when there was previously a bar on that? So, so fair use is actually assessed differently for all three of these different types of rights. Uh, copyrights, trademarks, and rights of publicity. Um, copyright is actually generally the only one that's codified in the law, and there's a section you can go look at. Uh, trademark is not, and it varies widely depending on where in the country you are. Uh, California is very uh, favorable on fair use against trademark rights. So you see the, the rule here at the end in California, 
uh, they follow this test where as long as your work is expressive in nature, so it's not an advertisement. Um, it's e even if you're making money off of it, it's expressive, like a book or a painting or a TV show or even a video game. And so long as use of the trademark has minimal artistic relevance, it's a fair use unless you are explicitly misleading people as to the source. So we'll get into that a little bit right now with some content, with some, uh, some examples. So this one here has been in the news recently. Uh, this is a screenshot from the TV show, Sex and the City. Uh, so what happens, as you can see, he's on a Peloton bike. Um, so I haven't seen the episode, but I've read that something bad happens to this character, Big or Mr. Big, while he's on the Peloton bike. And thereafter, Peloton stock went down a lot the next day after this episode came out. And there, there are big questions about, well, can Sex and the City do that? I mean, they're, you know, Peloton's suffering economically because of this. And the answer is yes, they absolutely can. Um, so the, the episode of the TV show is definitely artistic in nature. The use was relevant. I mean, it, it was part of the storyline. And the episode doesn't explicitly mislead people into thinking it was sponsored by Peloton. You know, it wasn't uh, Sex in the City as, as sponsored by Peloton episode, right? And in fact, quite the opposite, uh, because the character suffered, uh, uh, suffered from going on the bike. Uh, it was actually detrimental to Peloton. So, so quite the opposite as far as explicitly misleading consumers. So this is a fair use. This one is a, a pretty clear one. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight with this slide is that um, oftentimes these do overlap. So this was both a copyright claim uh, an artist named Murakami, I believe, did Louis Vuitton's toile, but with these, these specific colors uh, that they started putting on, on bags. And Nadia Plesner, who's an artist out of uh, Denmark and the Netherlands, actually did a few social commentary paintings, one of which was called Starfernica, um, one of which, Starfernica was a, a very large mural of a whole lot of different images. And this specific one from the mural caught everybody's eye, uh, a refugee child from Darfur. And uh, so she did a, a, second, um, a, a second work, just called Simple Living uh, with the refugee child with a, a chihuahua dressed up and a very expensive Louis Vuitton handbag. Um, so that should be pretty clear to everyone, but yes, absolutely. Um, this is an expressive use. It is most certainly not uh, misleading saying that Louis Vuitton came up with this. Uh, this, is, this is really the sort of pinnacle of fair use. It's sending a message about materiality, about expensive taste, um, while other folks are, are suffering in the world. Um, Louis Vuitton still actually tried to enforce against these folks, uh, but were not successful in that. Um, so it's a good example of both trademark and copyright fair use on that one. So the next one is actually a little bit, some might say uh, a closer call. Uh, this is actually, these were canvas tote bags made by a uh, single woman, woman company out of Santa Monica called My Other Bag. Um, so basically what you did was just take kind of your, your canvas tote bags that you would take to the grocery store, put caricatures of really famous, expensive, well-known bags on one side, and then put the text my other bag on the other side dot 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 and uh, it's a it's a play on bumper stickers for things like my other car is a jaguar or a porsche or, or what have you um so anyway so this actually went um through the second circuit court of appeals uh, and uh, cert got denied at the supreme court and this was decided to be fair use as a matter of law a judge decided it without going to a jury um, and basically what they said was that you're juxtaposing the very expensive image, this caricature, and then you're doing it in a playful way by, number one, making it a caricature. It's not an exact representation. It's got handles painted on. Um, and then you're also juxtaposing it onto this kind of cheap canvas tote bag. Um, so it was found that this was parody and was fair use. Um, and an important point from this case was that the Second Circuit pointed out that parody and criticism don't have to be 
super mean to still qualify as fair use. In fact, in this case, the maker of these bags was a very big Louis Vuitton fan. She had tons of their handbags, uh, but she realized and, and still thought, you know, you could still poke fun at things like that. And the court said that that was okay. Um, if you're you're sending a message with this product. So that's one reason um, that this was fair use. The other reason is, oh no, Brian, someone put this slide because we were their lawyers. So that was great. So that was a, probably the highlight of our uh, legal career um, at all. Um, one just kind of quick 30 second story from this case is Brian and I went to, uh, to Manhattan for the appellate hearing on this and there's a, a foyer outside the courtroom where you had to wait before they open the doors. And so, you know, people are, are waiting in that room and Brian and I and our local counsel arrived at the same time. Uh, and we, we walked into the, to the foyer with Louis Vuitton's counsel as they arrived too. And sure enough, my, uh, my mom had taken the train up from Philadelphia and was sitting there dressed up completely to the nines uh, but with this raggedy My Other hat Bag handbag that I'd given her for Christmas with all of her stuff in it. So it's just a perfect, she was, she was dressed up, you know, luxury and then had this bag sitting there and the Louis Vuitton attorneys were not amused. And uh, Brian and I were, were cracking up and um, that's kind of fair use in a, in a nutshell. You know, we were, we were laughing at the thing while Louis Vuitton was clearly not uh, and it was decided to be fair use, so. So, so far, every single example in the trademark context has been fair use. Uh, and then in California, this is the first time that someone has said something could be found to be explicitly misleading. And actually, it wasn't actually found to, to be explicitly misleading, but the judge said, we've got to send this to a jury. Um, this was a greeting card, as you can see. Honey badger, don't give an SHIT is a... Uh, a phrase that was out there it was a line of videos. And basically the, the maker of the videos trademarked that term for his products. Somebody else came out with a, a, um, a greeting card and used it. And the court said, this could actually be seen as explicitly misleading. So this might potentially be infringement and not fair use. So there we go. So next, try to go through these a little bit quickly, but the right of publicity. So you're talking about people's names, image, likeness. Generally speaking, it's a test that's very similar to copyright. Um, it's did you transform their name, image, likeness into, into something new and some new expression. Um, right of publicity, the analysis is actually much closer, whereas I would say there's, there's almost a presumption of fair use when you're using trademarks. Right of publicity is a person's personal right and so courts give it a lot more deference than a uh, business or commercial right like, like trademark is. Uh, so it's a much closer analysis. So. so this is actually a California Supreme Court case um, that really is the, the basis for right of publicity, most right of publicity decisions here in California. Um, an artist took a picture of the Three Stooges and made lithographs and t-shirts out of it. Uh, this was, as you can see by the title, uh, not fair use because you weren't transforming their image in any real way. So the, uh, the Three Stooges, actually the three people who owned the Three Stooges rights, because those rights are assignable, it was a, a different company, um, won that lawsuit against a guy named Gary Satara. There's a signature. So NCAA football and rock band. Uh, so some of you, if you're gamers, NCAA football actually disappeared for a very long time. Uh, and that's because of a guy named Sam Keller, who was a quarterback at Arizona State and then Nebraska, uh, led a lawsuit saying, you guys can't use our names, images, and likenesses in these games um, without our consent. And because we're not getting paid, we're not giving you our consent. Now, NFL players, uh, it's part of their contract. They get paid and they give up the rights to use their, their NIL rights. NCAA football players never gave up those rights. Uh, so court said, you cannot use those players, um, their names, images, or likenesses. So all those video sports video, or excuse me, college sports video games went away. Uh, over here on the right, this is from the game Rock Band. This is a, a very important decision in California. Um, you might realize from the lyrics, that's No Doubt uh, with Gwen Stefani. Uh, those are essentially avatars of the band members. 
if you zoom in or get a better shot, it does actually look like the band members. Um, and that was not fair use. Court's reasoning there was that you were essentially just taking band members and, and reproducing them in a video context. There's, there's nothing really transformative about that. They're doing the same thing in the video game that they do in real life, just like uh, with the, the football context. They're, they're playing football just like they do in real life. Now to two that were fair use. Right. So the Hurt Locker was actually based on a, a soldier's real life story uh, from the war in Iraq. Um, that movie was, was basically somewhat biographical in nature, although obviously they took creative freedom, artistic freedom with it. Um, the other one over here on the right was from the FX show Feud and Olivia de Havilland um, was not pleased with how she was uh, portrayed in that TV show. So both the sergeant from the Hurt Locker and Olivia de Havilland sued and the courts did find fair use there. Um, these works both were very expressive in nature. Really also one of the distinctions that kind of came through here was that these were about subjects of real true public interest, um, especially the Hurt Locker. It, it was much more in that, though uh, the, the feud case also cited the Hurt Locker case quite a bit. But when you're talking about things that are really of public interest and the American public wants to or needs to hear these stories, then um, you're much more likely to find to find fair use there. So, so we'll wrap up on fair use just with a few quick takeaways. Um, so number one, don't just use people's IP rights gratuitously to bring attention to you. That's, that's going to be a problem. Um, you've got to use it in a logical way. It kind of makes sense with the work that you're making. Uh, and if possible, you need to transform that IP, that name, image, likeness, or that trademark. Uh, kind of like the My Other Bag case, she made it a caricature and changed the letters and, and put it onto a canvas tote. You, you transform it. Um, and the better message you have, the better. The more clear your message is, uh, that really helps out with uh, arguing that your case is expressive. Oddly enough, the more critical it is, the better it is, um, which the more critical it is, the, the matter the target is probably going to be. Uh, but at the same time, that, that will heavily favor a finding of fair use. The second to last point here, um, Pyrrhic victories are hardly victories at all. Just because you might be right on a fair use test doesn't mean that it's going to be a, a complete win. Um, folks go, go bankrupt from these things. Um, folks lose business from lawsuits, or even if you go and win at the very end of the day, you, by that point, you've lost all your customers. Um, so you, know, you really need to really go from the start before you're making your products go above and beyond to, to really make clear that it's fair use. And the final point here is that fair use goes two ways. Everyone, you know, maybe you're thinking as artists, um, you know, oh, what can I do to, to take someone else's IP and transform it? Um, well, that applies to what people can do to your work as well. Uh, and you know, specifically in the, in the My Other Bag case, there was a, a line from the judge that said, sometimes it's better to laugh than it is to sue, right? So you, know, you just need to realize that sometimes folks, um, you, know, you might be the one who's, uh, who, who folks are poking fun at and uh, there might be a fair use defense for that. So, all right. So from there again, uh, I'm Corey Donaldson. Thanks for your time. I will hand it off to Jay Heibel to talk about non-fungible tokens in the news, NFTs. So. Hello, everybody. Jay Heibel here. I'm an IP attorney. I practice with Corey, Brian Philpott, and Brian Fitzgerald. And um, pleasure to be able to speak with you folks today. And thank you, Jacqueline, for setting this all up. Um, we decided that um, we wanted to shift gears a little bit and focus on a topic that was listed as one of the topics of interest to you artists and um, musicians, but also was a topic that's um, in the news today quite a bit um, and is more so as time passes on. And my focus here today is just to give you some background on NFTs and to uh, discuss some of the IP issues related to those. And uh, 
give you the caveat that this is ever evolving area of law and technology. So it's something you're probably gonna wanna keep up on if you're interested and that is only done by being online and seeing the evolutionary steps. So um, let's jump into it. Just to give you a little bit of background on, uh, go ahead and jump back, will you, Corey? Just to give you a little background, um, I am was never an NFT expert, but April of last year, a client contacted me and said, hey, I've been contacted by a third party that wants to develop some M NFTs in some of my products. And can you advise me as to whether I can do that and, um, you know, whether I'll be infringing other people's rights if I sell NFTs in, in, in some of these products. And as a set, it was a, a seller of products, some of which were his, some of which were parties, uh, products of third parties. So he was worried about um, selling NFTs of products that weren't necessarily developed by him. So the, my reaction to his email, initial email was, what is an NFT? I don't even know what that is. So it set me on a path of trying to learn about what NFTs are. And I've, I've come to find that it's, it's a very interesting um, area of law that I sometimes, area of technology and law that I sometimes don't understand, but is very interesting. And just to give you an example, the, the image that you're seeing on this slide is what an, an image they call Nyan Cat. And it, the image is a Pop-Tart with a cat body flying through the air with a rainbow coming out the back. And that NFT sold for approximately $600,000. And that was the first NFT I came across. And I was thinking, I just don't understand this, but um, it sent me down the road to figure out why someone would pay $600,000 for that image. So go ahead, Corey. So the first question I asked um, myself was, well, okay, a non-fungible token, if something's non-fungible, then well, what is fungible? Um, and so what I what I discovered is a dollar bill is fungible, um, Bitcoin is fungible, and the, the key issue here is that for each of these, each of the units of the dollar bill or the Bitcoin has the same value and they're interchang interchangeable. So that much I could understand. I could understand fungible, but then um, that led me to the question of okay, what's non-fungible? Go ahead, Corey. So non-fungible would be one of a kind asset. Um, so some of the things that would be considered non-fungible are digital artwork. Um, there's a website out there called NBA Top Shots, I believe, that has NBA virtual trading cards and, and clips. Original tweets would be one of a kind asset, virtual real estate and event tickets. Um, and in looking at what was considered non-fungible, I came across another um, NFT that was sold and it was the one shown here in the lower corner and it said Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of Twitter, it was his original tweet and he sold the NFT in that original tweet um, for 2.9 million. So that's another one where I'm not sure I understand exactly what the value is in it, but I guess the value is what the marketplace will bear and somebody in the marketplace thought that that was worth 2.9 million. Um, so here's another NFT that I came across that again, it, the numbers just keep going up. It's a collage of works by the artist Beeple. And this amazingly went for $69 million. And as I was looking into this particular NFT, um, I realized that I could make a copy, a digital copy of the collage and paste it onto my uh, desktop. And um, it would be easy to do and no problem. So I was really wondering what um, it is that somebody's paying $69 million for since I could make a digital copy of it myself. And really what it is, is ownership, claim of ownership. And there's some other rights that can also go along with that, but just really claim of ownership in the original file. So my next step in the process was to look into NFTs and the technology behind them. 
and NFTs are built on blockchains. And we've all heard a lot about blockchains with um, currencies like Bitcoin. And so these are now being applied in other areas like NFTs. And one, I went into the process to figure out, okay, how do you go about um, building this blockchain? Um, and there's different blockchains out, platforms that are out there, um, but the NFTs typical, typically use Ethereum and Polygon. Um, and so a process of the, creating the blockchain is a digital work is tokenized, which means it has a specific value assigned to that um, asset. Some, some of the terms that also go with it are the term hash. Um, and then once that initial block is created, it's distributed um, to a database among nodes of a computer network. And the computer network I've come to find is a very important part of blockchain technology because it is the computer network that maintains the integrity and the accuracy of the, of the assets and the blockchain itself. Um, the blockchain then collects information related to the NFT in groups or blocks. And these are transactions related to that and they're all tied together. The blocks are strung together based on the last transaction and the computer network maintains this irreversible timeline, timeline of these data transactions. So that's really what keeps um, the NFTs and the cryptocurrencies valid and um, accurate. So here's just a quick uh, blockchain example. I don't wanna go into too much detail on this, but this kind of just shows the flow of the blockchain and how it's how the computer network is involved in it and the nodes and and um, so that each of the it's very hard when you have a blockchain to um, hack it um, because the actual blockchains um, are monitored on these multiple computers and if there's one that looks different from the others there's an alert, essentially an alert. So that's one of the ways that the accuracy and the authenticity is, is maintained. Go ahead, Corey. So I, once you, I learned about blockchain and how NFTs live on blockchains, I thought, well, how, how are we going to create an NFT? And some of the, one of the ways is to go to, um, well, first of all, you need to set up a crypto wallet. And the world of NFTs deals on cryptocurrencies. So you need a crypto a wallet set up that'll hold your cryptocurrency and also your NFTs. And uh, Coinbase is one of the popular um, crypto wallets where it's fairly easy to, to put one together. The next one is to, uh, next step is to select an NFT marketplace. And OpenSea and Rabble are the ones that I would can repeatedly see as places to um, uh, create your NFT. Um, you go through a step of connecting to your wallet, you create your NFT, and you complete the listing and you push a button that lists the NFT for sale. And um, there was a lot of talk also about, about listing an NFT for sale on these sites that, you know, the real marketing comes after that because you then need to get on your, all your social media platforms and, and tell people that you're listing your NFTs for sale. Really what this is all about is monetizing your IP and your works of art. And um, the first step in monetizing IP is selling your NFT. So you get the revenue from the first sale, but that's going to um, be minus commissions and some fees that are involved. So if you're selling um, on some of these NFT websites, it'd be it would be important to look at the fees and commissions that are involved. There were some stories I read of uh, fees and commissions consuming the, the uh, sale price and the artist selling the NFT was left with, with essentially nothing. So be aware of that. Um, and what I think one of the more interesting things that I came across in learning about NFTs was the ability to have royalties on subsequent sales. And this can be very important. Um, with each building of a NFT, there's a smart contract that's developed. Um, and that's the smart contract lays out the terms of the sales of your NFT. And it, and it lives with the NFT as long as the NFT is alive. There's the opportunity to 
um, put terms in the smart contract where you get a percentage of secondary sales. So if you sell a um, NFT and there's subsequent uh, purchases, you can get a, a, a percentage of that. And it's the potential for a long, long standing revenue stream. So that's an important thing to think about. Um, buying an NFT, I'll just go, you know, this is, I'll go through this quickly. You need to set up a crypto wallet, select your NFT marketplace, place, select an uh, NFT for purchase, and just confirm the purchase with your wallet. And then you're an owner of an NFT. Um, so NFTs um, are really purely a digital asset um, and can be digital versions of the underlying physical assets. So um, the question at, comes up as to who owns the physical version and what are they gonna do with it? And who owns the digital version? In, in looking at the NFT world, it seems like there's a, uh, a trend towards offering multiple digital versions. Um, I saw people just uh, downloaded a NFT for sale, but there was a hundred different versions of it for sale. So you're getting one of a hundred like you would a print, but who's gonna own the original digital one? And the que another question comes to mind is what's to prevent them from drop from uh, putting up another hundred versions for sale. So um, there's a lot of different questions that are out there and it's gonna be ever evolving. But um, one of the things that also came up is how will the digital asset be maintained? Um, with your NFT, you're going to have either the digital asset as part of your blockchain, or else it's gonna have a link to the um, digital version in another server or another location. And you need to be careful as to who, how's that digital asset can be maintained um, because these NFTs apparently can last for quite some time. So, um, that's something to consider and it's something to take into account in your smart contract. Um, again, NFT is typically not purchased of the underlying asset. Um, and one of the things that I think is the trend, as I mentioned, is the multiple NFTs of the same digital file. And you know, the, the whole notion of being non-fungible is, non is that it's an original asset, but if there's going to be multiple versions of it, does it stop being non-fungible? Um, and also anyone can make a digital copy of the NFT. So um, it will be the exact copy of the NFT, but you won't be the owner. So it's a, it's a strange kind of um, concept. Um, and also under the uh, smart contract, you can um, outline licensing of your NFT or under licensing of the underlying asset. So, um, NFT does not typically transfer rights to the underlying asset, but you can sell rights in the underlying asset with the NFT if you have a separate agreement to that effect. Um, and what another thing I thought was interesting is that the smart contract can also put um, certain restrictions on the IP rights that are, um, are transferred with the um, NFT. For instance, CryptoKitties permits NFT owner to commercialize Kitty up to $100,000 per year. Um, not exactly sure how they enforce that, but that's one of the interesting terms that came out of one of these licensing deals. And then NBA Top Shots really does not want you to do anything as far as commercializing from uh, the NFT that you purchase. So you can put those together in different ways on your smart contract. Um, so misuse of IP, um, really this, this is um, one of the interesting um, areas for NFTs because it really falls on the artist or the property owner to determine if there's misuse of IPs out there. There was talk um, of minting of unauthorized NFTs, meaning somebody else trying to mint a work that is not theirs. And a lot of these sites really don't police that. So it becomes the um, responsibility of the owner of the work to police and others that folks are making unauthorized NFTs of your of your of your works. So um, there's also use outside the license terms. That's got to be policed by the owner as well. And then there's the typical infringement of copyrights and trademarks, um, some of which uh, Brian and Corey talked about. But again, this is going to be something that the NFT owner is going to have to police themselves, which is um, 
no small task, I imagine. So um, again, we got to monitor IP enforcement. You need to monitor the NFT marketplace. One option like they have for Amazon um, and other sites is you could have a request that somebody be taken down from the NFT marketplace if they're making unauthorized copies of your NFT. Um, you could also request information from the NFT marketplace if there's a pro prolific unauthorized minter. Um, and that then you could take legal action in the courts if that's appropriate. Um, and then if they're not acting in accordance with the smart contract, one of the NFT, of your NFT purchasers, you can bring a breach of contract action or an IP infringement action, but it really falls on the NFT owner. Um, and lastly, this is just one of the other issues that seems to be um, an issue again is confirming the NFT is authentic. And these are some of the steps you can take to um, be sure that, or at least do the best you can to be sure that an NFT is authentic. So I think I'm about at the end of my time and I know I went through a lot here, but uh, if you can feel free to contact me if you have any other questions on NFTs. And on that, I will turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Jay. Um, so I'm going to try to get through this at a good, good pace because, you know, time constraints and everything. Um, so I'm just going to cover the estate planning concerns for an artist's IP. Um, we can go to the next slide, Corey. So um, this is about, th this first slide is confirming, uh, you know, discussing copyright basics, which I think uh, Rebecca covered very uh, succinctly, so um, just kind of like what's what's available for copyright, and this is important to understand, like what rights you have. Um, so uh, we could we can go to the next slide. So um, copyright term is a very important uh, thing to know when you're setting up like an estate for you know your potential heirs, um, and currently it's. The life of the author plus 70 years after the author's death. Um, uh, and there's also, um, you know, for joint works, it's the uh, last surviving author. And for anonymous works, it's um, 95 years from the year of its first publication or a term of 120 years for the. Okay. Um, okay. A copyright should be. Uh, reviewed by the should be viewed by the artist as not a single right but a conglomeration of interrelated rights and this is important because there, there could be actually um, multiple legal copyrights in one work so as I think Rebecca covered um, a song there, there's no such thing as just a copyright to a song there's a there's a musical composition element and there's the masters or sound recording element to the song uh, where the musical comp composition is the actual underlying song, like the lyrics set to the music and the um, sound recording is the thing that gets radio play. It's the version that you understand. And that comes up a lot. I think I saw a um, question in the Q&A box about Taylor Swift re-recording -re her music. It, she's essentially doing that because it's like she's covering her own songs. Like she doesn't have the right to the underlying musical composition, but as um, in Rebecca's presentation, uh, you can get a mechanical license to, to cover a, a musical composition, but um, you actually need permission to uh, utilize the sound recording. So you'll see things, I, I think uh, just about like five years ago or something, um, the musician David Byrne uh, from the Talking Heads uh, sent a cease and desist letter to some politician that was us using one of his songs because he was using the actual sound recording, but that um, same politician might have been able to get away with it if he had his own band cover the songs. There was a famous, another famous case where someone covered their own music in um, uh, the show um, happy days, the theme song, they couldn't get the actual rights to it. So they had the actual artist like cover his own song um, because they couldn't get the rights to the masters. 
Um, and then, so that's that. So that's actual two different rights. Also, as Corey and Brian covered, um, there could be a overlap where you like Mickey Mouse could be a trademark and a copyright. Um, and then, in addition to just legal differences, where you could have multiple uh, copyrights in one work, uh, you could also further divide it through contract law and licensing agreements. Like you could grant licensing to North America or licensing for streaming rights or, or, or movie rights. Um, so uh, you need to really understand what you actually hold because you may have lost some of your rights along the way if you licensed things for certain purposes, like the right to use your song in a commercial or something. Uh, you may not be able to pass that portion of your rights down to your heirs. We can go to the next slide. Um, so a good question to ask your state planning attorney is when do any severed rights revert back to my estate or how do the terms of any licensing contracts my copyrights are subject to affect my estate? We can go on. Uh, reversion is a possible avenue to recoup uh, severed copyrights. Um, so uh, after uh, 35 years from when you granted uh, a portion of your copyright rights to someone else, uh, you can, uh, you know, through 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 statute, uh, potentially cancel that grant. Um, so that is something that uh, you should you could consider. Um, if it's available and your and that passes on to your heirs so you might want your heirs to be informed about that as well um so uh, only while the author's alive only he or she can use the reversion uh provisions afterwards it it goes to their heirs next uh along with copyright like as Corey mentioned right of publicity is also a uh an important uh you know IP right, and this is governed by state law instead of federal law, and it's going to differ by state, and it's also potentially available to pass down to your heirs. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So in California, uh, this this is this the statute saying that um, you you can actually pass down your uh, publicity rights so that your family of a famous person could inherit the rights to their likeness and images. Uh, we can go to the next one. So, so states uh, differ on the survivability uh, and the right of publicity. So some states don't allow it to survive. California does. It was passed in the Celebrities Rights Act. Um, and the right of publicity to a deceased person's publicity rights uh, in California extends for 70 years past their, their death that their uh, state can make it. This is a famous case. There's uh, Bela Lugosi as Dracula there. Um, after, after his death, uh, Universal Pictures continued to mercilessly exploit his image, even in unrelated things, not just to use his image to promote the film Dracula, but they kind of used all their universal monsters like Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolf Man as like iconic trademarks of, of universal pictures. And uh, Lugosi's heirs sued them for misuse of his life, likeness. And they, the family won at trial, but on appeal, the California, the California Supreme Court ruled that deceased celebrities have no right to their likeness and existing rights do not pass to heirs. So the Celebrities Rights Act was passed um, by the legislature in California and directly basically overturned that case. Okay, next slide. So um, as right of publicity is a property right, it could be subject to contract just like the copyrights can. So you might want to understand what publicity rights um like your likeness 
you've already uh, assigned away. Like maybe you said you could use your likeness on like a Wheaties box or something in the case of a um, famous athlete. Uh, and then, so, so some of your likeness rights might not be able to, to, to pass on if they've already been subject to contracts. So that's an important thing to ask your estate planning attorney. Um, Brian, can you make a couple of last comments? Cause we're at time. Okay, sure. Um, okay. Here, here's my last slide. Um, so, um, yeah, if you have any questions, you could um, contact uh, Ferguson Case or Patterson, and there's my email right there. Uh, you could also contact Jay, Corey, or Brian. Um, I work with all of them, and it's important to understand what copyright and publicity rights your state has on both the statutory factors, like do I have multiple actual copyright interests, like in, in the case of a song, or through the contract factors, did I divide up my rights before I, uh, uh, it, yeah. did I divide up my rights and then now uh, they're limited? Um, and then you might wanna discuss with your estate planning attorney if, uh, if you either inherited um, some copyrights or rights of publicity and then some copyrights um, and, or if you, um, are passing them on in your estate, you might, might want to discuss if maybe after the, the statutory time limit, you can get a reversion. And um, I, I have closed here. Uh, There's a famous uh, right of publicity case, Elvis Presley Enterprises versus Capisi. And it's a Texas case. And uh, well, after the judge ruled in his actual decision, he closes with Elvis's famous phrase, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Brian, and thank you to all of our panelists, Rebecca, Jay, Corey, um, Brian Philpod. Really appreciate it. If all of the panelists could please turn their cameras on um, at this point, we're going to move to the Q&A. And I'm going to start with a question that was emailed to us. It's not in the Q&A um, box. And you know, for our participants who are still listening, you're welcome to still type in some more questions. This question is from a collage artist who asked, how far can a collage artist go in incorporating other artists' work into theirs without violating IP law? It's a fair use question. Um, I know that you addressed fair use very extensively, but if um, other of our fair use presenters would like to comment upon that question. Okay, sure. It's a, I think essentially the answer is, um, show it to us and then we'll kind of be able to analyze it a little bit more. Uh, it's, you know, when it comes to fair use uh, and, and compiling different things, it's really, really very much a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, as, as Brian mentioned, it's, it's really going to be, uh, you know, it would be good to take those other works and alter them in some way as you're putting them into the collage. Uh, it would also be good if the collage as a whole had its sort of own expressive message. Um, and, and you know, separate from the individual works. Uh, so those are sort of considerations, but it's, it's very much a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Corey. Here's another question. Um, as an artist, once you sell a physical painting to an outside entity, can you still make copies of it to use in your other work or to showcase your work, even though you no longer own the original painting? I, I don't, Brian, why don't you go ahead and answer that? Yeah, I think you might be. I, I was just going to ask Jacqueline to repeat. I, I cut out there, so I missed a part of, the, of your question. Sure. As an artist, once you sell your physical painting that you created to an entity, let's say to a business, can you still make copies of that artwork and use it in your other work or to showcase the work that you've created, even though you no longer own it? So for example, if the person had a website and they wanted to show examples of their work, can they still showcase it? Um, it, it, it depends on the, the reasons that you're, that you're using it. There is a, there's also a, a doctrine called the uh, uh, first sale doctrine, which allows a person who buys a copyright work to, to resell that. And, and some of the copy of those bundle of copyrights go with that first sale. Um, the rights that are retained, that's sometimes up to the artist. Well, it's always up to the artist. They can 
explicitly say that I'm retaining certain rights and, and I'm only selling a portion of those bundle of rights. Remember the acronym was CAD PD that comes with the copyright. So it really is up to the terms of the sale. Um, typically though, if you're selling a one of a kind uh, work of art, you're, you're, unless you reserve rights, you're selling the entire bundle of rights to the person who, who buys that. So uh, technically you would need their permission to use copies of that work, even though it was originally yours, um, unless you can make a case that it's a fair use. Rebecca, this might be a question for you because um, it has to do with music. Is there a legal reason that many songs are remastered years after they were first recorded? For example, Here Comes the Sun was recorded in 1969, but then remastered in 2006. Remastering is used to update the audio characteristics and qualities, but do the legal rights or entitlements change? So oftentimes remastering um, does not qualify for sufficient um, copyright protection, just because when you remaster something that was recorded many years ago, um, they change the mixes, the quality of the sound um, and other technicalities to make it sound more crisp or better um, for the updated um, technology that we have today. But there's not enough um, original expression that goes into remastering um, a song. So oftentimes the the record label, you know, they still own the song as long as the copyright is good. They just, um, they just basically, it's like a copy, but a better copy. And um, the royalties still go back to the original owner. Um, I think I saw a question later that um, I believe Brian Fitzgerald sort of answered um, regarding Taylor Swift. So that was different than remastering, that's re-recording. So re-recording is where the artist actually re-records the entire song. And so there's different producers often on it. There's different musicians. Um, the way they sing the song is different. Different lyrics can be added. So there's enough sufficient originality that a new copyright can be created. And in the event of Taylor Swift, she, um, her original recording was purchased by um, or assigned to Big Machine Records. So this was years ago when she didn't have, um, you know, a lot of clout. And so that's why often sound recordings get assigned to record labels or um, companies. And so later on, she wanted to be able to, um, to have the rights to her music. And so what she did is she re-recorded, which is then um, enough, adding enough sufficient originality so that she can have her own copyright for that work. Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, Corey, this is a question for you. Um, how do these concepts apply to using reference images? For example, for example, referencing photographs of exotic animals or space or other things that might be difficult to get references of for a painting. Sorry, can you say that one more time? How do these intellectual property concepts apply to using reference images? For example, referencing photographs of exotic animals or space or other things that might be difficult to get access to, but you want to use them for reference in a painting that you are creating. Right. So, so again, it's going to need to be sufficiently different. It's going to need to be a, a again, a case by case basis. Uh, but you absolutely can look at the world around you. You're going to want to probably look at lots of references so that you're not copying just one. Um, so look at lots of different reference images of that animal, animal or, or that you know, object in order to come up with your, your own image um, and, and then use that. So that's probably the best advice I can give at that point without sort of looking at an actual example. Thanks, Corey. Jay, here's a question for you. I've heard a benefit to artists with NFTs is that the artist can continue to be paid for their work with reproduction, but that seems to be a task to police um, or some sort of law enforcement left up to the artist. That seems to be a task to police or enforce left up to the artist. Is that correct? So uh, we talked about the uh, smart contract that can be developed when you first um, form your NFT. And in the smart contract, there can be terms put in that specifically address um, ongoing revenue stream for additional transactions down the road. So once that's part of the NFT, then it really is something that should happen automatically as the NFT goes through different transactions. So it's not something that really needs policing, although I would keep an eye on it, but it should be something that is handled in the smart contract and if done right, can um, happen automatically. 
This is a question for um, either Brian Fitzgerald or Brian Philpott. Um, do registered domain names and their content automatically pass to one's heirs? Registered domain names are um, a property right. And you might also have some trademark rights um, in, in the domain name too, depending on if the domain name contains one of your registered trademarks. Um, it's a, basically uh, the biggest takeaway um, from the estate planning thing that I wanna uh, make sure if you take one thing away is um, think, think of your rights as basically a lot of little rights together because you might have a copyright, a trademark, uh, a right of publicity, a uh, registered domain name, like all those things, there could be overlap between all those various avenues of IP. Um, so uh, your, your registered domain name would, you know, you'd probably want that to be in your like will or trust or however you want it set up to pass on to your heirs with your other rights because otherwise it you know it would pass on to your heirs like in an intestate situation because it's part of your estate but you would you really want to plan for everything so it just doesn't go down to your heirs by statute through like an automatic intestate type situation that Jacqueline I would just add that I I like to just think of intellectual property rights as assets right and those assets can be sold they can be licensed and they can certainly flow uh, through a will or even through a test to see if, it, if the decedent doesn't have a will to the heirs. So it's important to, to always make sure to keep track of those and keep a list of them somewhere so that you can make sure that they go to who you want them to go. But they are assets just like you know personal property or real property and can and should flow to heirs accordingly. Brian Philpott, while I have you, I have a question for you. Um, is there a limit on the amount of text quoted in the body of an article or essay? Um, of course, giving full credit to the author and the source. In this case, the um, individual would be quoting from the yet unpublished journal and diaries of a visual artist who's now deceased. These writings may or may not be published one day, and the director of her nonprofit foundation is giving her access to those writings and permission to use them. Any thoughts? Well, if you have permission of the, of the, the copyright holder, then you can use as much of it as you want. Um, again, fair use comes into play whenever you want to use a copyright holder's underlying work without the permission of the, of the holder. So if, if, for example, the permission they have isn't adequate and someone's just saying, yes, you can go ahead and use it, but um, they don't really have the right to do that, then it would fall back on your typical fair use analysis. And you look at how much of that unpublished journal is copied and used. What is the purpose for using it? Is it for educational reasons or, or purely commercial reasons? You would go through that checklist in the same way. But again, all of that is moot if the owner of that copyright has given permission for the user to use it. Then, it, then the, the, the bounds of, um, of your use are defined by that permission. Great, thank you so much. We have several other questions, but I see that we're running out of time. So I'm gonna turn things back over to Eric. Um, from the museum to close us out. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Uh, I just want to thank uh, you, uh, Jacqueline Ruffin, Rebecca Macatalo, uh, Brian Philpott, Corey Donaldson, Jay Habel, Brian Fitzgerald, uh, and the Ventura County Bar Association. Thank you all so much for coming together to do this uh, and making time for it in your busy schedules. Uh, I personally have heard from artists in the past couple of weeks how valuable uh, they thought this program could be, and uh, it certainly was. Uh, thank you attendees for being here for the program today. I'm going to put up a slide here that does have uh, contact information. There we go. Uh, so thank you everyone for being here. Please keep up with museum happenings at our website venturamuseum.org and have a wonderful afternoon.